So this morning, we're going to get started with Martin Fleischer. And Martin, I, I have more, less gray hair than you do, but my memory is a lot shorter. <laughs> so correct me if I'm wrong. Martin was in the 397, right? 397. And you were uh, actually flying missions from before D-Day until VE Day, correct? Well, not, not VE Day. I got all my missions finished before D-Day, okay. before VE Day, and they went home cool. early. So with that, he tells a better story than I do, so I'm just going to give it to Martin. Oh, good morning. Uh, all right, I was, um, first of all, I came from, uh, from a family of uh, immigrants. My mother and father were both immigrants. I was the first of my generation born in this country. And uh, my father died when I was six years old. And my mother was a widow with three children. And a couple of years later, she married a man, a widower, with three children, two boys and a girl. So now we had one girl in the family, and we have six children. And then subsequently, there were two more later on, a boy and a girl. So that was the makeup of my family. And most of this was during the time of the Depression, because I was born in 1920. And my father died in 1926, and then we all grew up, children all grew up during the Depression. And it was kind of a rough time, but we made it. And uh, I always wanted to fly. And I was visiting with a grandmother of mine in Philadelphia when we saw an airplane. 1925, 26, you didn't see very many airplanes. But there was an airplane, boy, it was way up in the sky. And I told my grandmother, I said, Grandma, I'm going to fly one of these someday. And of course, that was one of my ambitions, I suppose, and it always carried on until I actually did fly. So anyway, uh, there were times like uh, we went to Hadley Airfield in New Jersey, which was a very small place. On my bicycle, I was 12 or 13 years old, traveled about 18 miles or so to get to Hadley Air, Air Force Base. And I think I spent $2 to get a ride in an airplane similar to the uh, to the trainers out here. Uh, my God, I forgot the name of the darn things. I've got uh, a steerman. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I got a ride in the steerman. And two, two of us, a friend of mine, both went down the bicycle. We both got in the back, and the guy took us around for about, oh, I guess two circles around the field and back down again. And uh, that was my first ride in an airplane. Then uh, when the time came, for the draft in 1941 that everybody had a draft number and you were called and I didn't want to be drafted I wanted to fly so if they drafted me they wouldn't be able to fly so I tried to take the, the I didn't go to college I just went to high school and in order to uh, be, uh, be, uh, get an application for pilot training you had to have either at least two years of college or pass a test with the equivalency of two years of college so I was a very poor student in school. I, was, I didn't really like school. The only thing I liked was math. That's, that's just about it. And uh, I didn't read very much. My vocabulary was bad. And when I took the test, there were 65 out of 150 questions pertaining to vocabulary. And because I didn't read very well, I, my vocabulary was very short, I failed the test. But I did start to go to airplane mechanics school before they, I was drafted. And as a result, when I was drafted, they felt, well, this guy's got some experience, we'll send him to airplane mechanic school. And that's what I got, without asking for it, and it was fortunate for me, because I liked it. So I went to airplane mechanic school from a guy who didn't do too good in high school out of a class of 300. I, fi I, I finished second, in the second highest in a class of 300. So it just goes to show you, if you like something, you persevere, you make it. So. Then after that, they sent me to school for B-26s because they wanted me to become a crew chief on a B-26. There were a number of us they took out of the class to send to, uh, to train them for B-26s to be crew chiefs. So I went there uh, for a couple months, and then when they came out, they sent me for assignment to Patterson Air Force Base in, uh, in Dayton, Ohio. And I waited there for about three months, and nothing happened. I felt, well, I still wanted to fly. Let's see if I can do it again. So I took the test. This time there were only 45 questions pertaining to vocabulary out of the 150. So I took the test and I passed it with 90% grade. So now all of a sudden I'm going to go to school again. So I went to, so the 
flying training, well, first of all, we were quarantined for three months because somebody at the camp that I went to before I went to uh, the flying training, somebody in the, in the camp had spinal, mind, uh, spinal meningitis. So we were quarantined for three months. So it's three months where you sat and did nothing. Nobody did anything. No training, no marching or anything for three months. And that was hair raising, really. But we had one good thing. We had a young fella there. He was only 18 at the time. I, by that time, I was about 23, so I was an old man. And this guy played boogie woogie. And boy, he was good. And everybody's always piled around him with the most unusual name in the world, Hudson Ford Packard. That was his name. Names that his, his parents must have been crazy about cars. His name was Hudson Ford Packard. Well, anyway, we spent most of our time with him. Then uh, finally, I went to airplane mechanic school. I graduated October 1st, uh, 1943. And I was assigned to a B-26 group, of all things. Well, I guess they figured, well, I knew the B-26, I was an airplane mechanic, well, let's send this guy. And it just so happened they were forming the last contingency of B-26s that were going to go overseas, the 397th Bomb Group. It was the last of all the ones that were going to Europe. So we went over to Europe, we left there in uh, February 1944, got there in March. My first mission was April 1944. And the training was not a lot of what we, we encountered because we couldn't very well do much, uh, much uh, encounters with machine gunning because there were no fighters to fly at. We didn't have any tow targets that, that, we could, that the gunners could practice against or anything. All they did was just shoot at something on the, on the ground. Now, if you're flying at a thousand feet and you're going to shoot anything on the ground, the airplane has to turn sideways, so he's going to keep going to circle. So you're just going to be aiming at a target, at a single target all the time because you're going to be flying around and only hitting one spot. So that wasn't much of a, uh, you know, much of an encounter, much of a uh, uh, good practice. But the pilot I had was, an ex the, that I was flying with at the time, he was an exceptionally good pilot. He had been a flying sergeant from before the war and then eventually they promoted him up to a lieutenant and then finally eventually he made captain. But he decided he wanted to give them a little better target. So with the airplane, when you tilt it, when you bank an airplane, you usually have to turn. Well, he banked the airplane, but he kept going straight. Now, it's very hard to keep it. And I'm sitting in the side seat there, and I'm hanging over, and I'm scared to death, because really, I'd only been in a B-26 that time, maybe two or three times. That's about all. But I was flying as, as a, uh, a co-pilot for him. I wound up getting airsick. And in the B-26, the pilot and co-pilot have a little hatch in the floor between them, so when you land and your landing gear is down, they can get in and out of the cockpit that way. So now I got sick, now what am I going to do, you know? So I just opened the hatch and I, and I heaved it there and I closed it up. When we landed that day, he wouldn't go out that way. He made them open the bomb bay doors so he could go out the bomb bay doors. Well, anyway, that's one of the experiences I had before we went overseas. Then, Overseas, there were two routes that they usually used when they sent B-26s over. One was the northern route, where they uh, where they went up through England, uh, through uh, Greenland, and then up through Newfoundland and, and uh, up that way around to Iceland and so forth until they got to England. But in the winter time, the weather was so bad that they used to have a lot of problems. So they decided we we're going to go the southern route because we were leaving in February. So the southern route was go to the Caribbean, some of the Caribbean islands, went to Trinidad, and then they went to one of the Guianas, I don't remember which one, and then uh, to the, uh, somewhere the mouth of the Amazon, and then finally Belém, which was the easternmost part of South America. And we flew from there to the Ascension Islands, which are in the middle of the South Atlantic. And the range on our airplane was not very long, so we had two Bombay tanks, each carrying 250 gallons. And all the navigators, we had navigators that were hired just for the trip over, and then they would come back once we got overseas. They were not combat uh, men. So we start, and, and they told the briefing officer, oh, we're never going to make it to the Ascension Islands because we used too much gasoline according to their calculations and about how many gallons per hour they use and so forth. So uh, the briefing officer told us, look, 
don't give me any arguments. He said, we sent thousands of airplanes this way, we haven't lost the one, so you're going to make it. So, of course, they, they had no more argument. So, sure enough, we take off, and we get out about three hours, which is time, roughly, we used enough gasoline out of our main tanks, you're supposed to pump from the bomb bays into the mains. They had two mains and two auxiliaries in the wings. So, as you use the mains, you take from the bomb bays first. So, I sent the engineer back to pump some of the gasoline from the Bombay tanks into the mains. And then I start checking the gauges, because I was flying as co-pilot, so I was able to, you know, order those things around while the pilot was flying. So anyway, uh, I'm checking the gauge, and it was on a turret, like six tanks, six gauges on a turret, and just kept turning from one to the other. Something wasn't right. I wasn't getting any gasoline any place, but the Bombay tanks were going down. So I call him back and he looks out the window and here all that fuel that he's pumping out is going into an auxiliary tank, which is full, out through the vent and it's going overboard. So she figured, uh oh, now what's going on here? So that means we lost 250 gallons of fuel. Some was pumped over, the rest we can't get out to send it where we wanted to. So anyway, he changed over to the other Bombay tank and for some reason or other that one worked and the other and the first one didn't. So we weren't quite to the point of no returns. So we figured, well, should we go or should we go? We were three hours out and we had a seven hour trip to make. So being a B-26 qualified mechanic, so to speak, I took over that part of the flying and I started to thin out the fuel air mixture. And then I wait till the engine coughed and I wait a little while and I'd pull up, pull the fuel air mixture back a little bit more to cough again. And then I felt when it was safe enough to leave it at that point, we decreased, we, we de I decreased the RPM, I think we were flying at 2100 RPM, so I figured, well, I'll cut it down to 1850 RPM, which is like putting a car into sixth gear, so you get better mileage. And then we dropped the nose very slightly, because we were fl flying roughly 7,000 feet. And I figured, well, we got plenty to go yet, so we'll just head it down a little bit, maybe 25 feet per minute or something. And we went on our way, and as we got to the uh, Ascension Islands, we asked for if we could fly straight in instead of making a pattern, because you had to make a pattern, go around the down, downwind leg, and then, the, and, then so, and then down to your final. So they said, sure. So we flew right straight in. Then when we checked, checked everything, the fuel transfer system, everything, found out that we had more, more fuel on board than any of the other airplanes because of what I did. And as a result, it turned out much later during our combat missions that it was a savior for us then too, and I'll tell you that a little later. But anyway, that was the first real experience we had that, uh, that you know, we learned something really good. And we finally got to the Ascension Islands and went to Africa, and uh, then we had to go up a portion of Africa, which was not near the coast, and then finally out near the coast, but on the way up to French Morocco, we had to go through a mountain range, which was about 18,000 feet. And normally a B-26, you have to have your, uh, uh, when you increase the horsepower and they increase the, uh, the air pressure into the horsepower, super, supercharger, supercharger, see that? Supercharger. We had superchargers on them, but usually you only use those at higher altitudes. But ours were not really uh, geared for them because we were never going to fly that high. The most highest altitude we usually fly, flew at any time was about 12,000 feet all during combat and everything else. So we had to go through this mountain range and they told us that there was a pass in the mountain range. So here we're flying in this valley and maybe, maybe the valley is two or three miles wide and it's not very easy to take a B-26 when you're traveling over 200 miles an hour and make a turn within a two or three, two or three mile area. And here these mountain ranges are so high we're flying there and we can hardly see sky. So, uh, so we're wondering, gee, we're not getting there, we're not getting there. But they told us, well, just keep flying down there. And after a certain time, you look to your left and you'll see, and you'll see a, uh, a, a nine foot uh, gap, an opening nine, at 9,000 feet. So, you know, with a little, you know, anxiety and everything, keep going all of a sudden, sure enough, about the time they told us, take a look, oh, there's the gap. So sure enough, we turned into the gap and we made it. So that was, a little, uh, little scary for us also. And we got up to England after flying, 
uh, stopping in French Morocco and then up to England. And um, then we got to our air base where we, where we started to uh, go out of uh, for bombing at the Braintree, England. The name of the field is Riven Hall. And we were there for the better part of, of well, up until uh, maybe a month or so after D-Day. And by that time, I had flown about 15 or 20 missions. And, um, and then on D-Day, we were supposed, and our, our job with these B-26s was to annihilate whatever the Germans had in northern France. So we went after marshalling yards, ammunition depots, railroad bridges, regular bridges, so, just so that they couldn't get any equipment or anything through where they wanted. And it was preparing everything all over that northern part of France, Normandy, and over Paris. So we were forever bombing that, and that was our mission. And we finally got the name of Coiners Bridge Busters. And I have a book that is, it's a, a pictorial history of the 397th bomb group, of a lot of the places we were at, and, and some of the way the men were working, the people we met, and the places we'd gone. And, uh, you know, it's just a pictorial history, very little uh, reading in it. So I have it, somebody wants a glance at it when I'm out there, they can just, you know, thumb through it and get a little, you know, a little information as to what was going on. Well, anyway, we flew three missions on, on D-Day. Well, my pilot was a very, very conscientious guy and a very conservative guy, so before you take off with an airplane each time, you have two magnetos, which is something like your ignition on the, your rotary ignition on, on a car. And uh, you, had to uh, you had to turn one magneto off if there wasn't a drop of, if there was a drop of more than 100 RPM, they told you don't take off and have to have a mechanic look at it. So D-Day here, two o'clock in the morning when we were ready to take off for the first mission. Uh, and, and we had, by the way, this is, this is something, we had a uh, correspondent from one of the New York newspapers was gonna fly with us. And his name happened to be Fleischer. He spells his with a C, I spell mine without a C. But anyway, he was on board and he was anxious to go, you know, just like anybody would for an experience like this. And so when they checked the RPM on the magnetos, it was a drop of 150 on each one. So he said, oh, I'm not taking off. And here this correspondent, all the other airplanes are taxiing out already to the lines. And so we were the only airplane that didn't take off that day. Normally we only had 12 airplanes or so go out on a mission. Well, every airplane went out on D-Day. And overnight, from on June the 5th, all the airplanes were just as they came out of the factory. On June the 6th, every airplane in the Allied forces, overnight, had black and white stripes on the wings and on the fuselage, so that any airplane that was up in the air while we were going over in France didn't have stripes, shoot it down. So. That's the way they knew not to fire a friendly aircraft, and there were no friendly aircraft lost due to friendly fire, so, which was extremely unusual. Of course, all the heavy bombers, the medium bombers, fighters were, every airplane that was in England flew, except ours. And, and they flew at various altitudes. The heavies usually flew at 30,000 feet. We usually flew at 12,000 feet, but our missions on this day one of them was at 2,000 feet, the other was at 4,000 feet. You spent more time looking out for your own airplane so you didn't run into them, and, and, and you couldn't observe anything. The only thing we could see was before we got to the, to, the, um, to the coast of the bombing site, you could see the water, the channel, was full of boats. Any, no matter where you looked, you saw boats. And then the... the uh, the battleships were firing their guns and everything. There was a lot of smoke coming up them. Well, anyway, we did our bomb run and we went back. Then about, uh, I guess, six o'clock in the morning, went out for another one. And after that, that mission, we come back and went out for a third one. So I flew, on, flew two missions that day instead of the three I was supposed to. And it was really a, a wonderful sight to see when you're sitting in my position. <laughs> With the enemy, I'm sure it wasn't. And we encountered very, very few uh, uh, the opposition from the enemy. Either that or maybe there were just so many of ours they just ran. I don't know. But anyway, uh, 
Uh, so after D-Day, we continued uh, on my um, my tour, and uh, I was flying as co-pilot most of the time with this crew. And here we're fighting the Germ uh, fighting Germany. They're trying to kill the Jews and Russians and everybody who was in German. My pilot was German. I'm Jewish, so here you got a Jewish guy with a German guy fighting Hitler, who's trying to kill the Jews. And I wouldn't leave him. I wanted to stay with my that crew because he was conservative the same way I was. He thought the way I did. I felt, well, we're a good team. I don't want to break it up. They were going to give me a crew who was fresh, who just came without, just came over to England without any, any experience. And here I'd have to have a green crew who wouldn't know anything. So I'd have to be flying the airplane and trying to tell some of the others what to do. So I wasn't looking forward to that. So I stayed with him all during the time I was there. But I managed to get 65 missions in before he did, so I went home before he did because every once in a while somebody, some other crew and co-pilot would get sick or something, so they just pick any other co-pilot to fill in for him. So I flew about two or three more missions than he did, so I had, so I went home a few days before he did. And uh, as I told you before, when we were flying over to the Ascension Islands, the problem we had with the fuel transfer system. We had a, tar a particular target that we went to, which was south of Paris. And our range was four and a half hours without bombing tanks, in, but with a bomb load and, and uh, everything else. We, uh, the, um, the target was four hours and 10 minutes out and back. So we went to the target, and on the way back, I employed that thing that I did when I went to the Ascension Islands. And we didn't have to keep as tight a formation because we kept a very, very tight formation where we flew 36 airplanes. We had six and six and six and then another six, another thing, the same sixes on the other side. There was like three airplanes and three airplanes made the six. So you had 18 and 18 is 36 airplanes. But over enemy territory, our airplane was so maneuverable and so responsive to our control that we flew very tight formation and we flew wingtip over wingtip. And I say wingtip over wingtip, I mean wingtip over wingtip. Most heavies and all other bombers flew alongside one another because they couldn't maneuver and control their airplanes as easily as we did. So because of the sensitivity that we had, we could fly very close. And many times, the tip of the other guy's wing may not have been more than 15 or 20 feet from our window. And then we had to make a 30-degree turn every 12 seconds in order to avoid uh, ACAC fire. Of course, the ACAC fire, most of it we hit was Panzer uh, tanks. And those 88s were very accurate. And it took, 50, it took 15 seconds for them to sight us, fire a shell to explode at our altitude. So every 12 seconds, in unison, the entire uh, group would make that 30 degree turn. It was not a slow turn, it was a definite turn, but not an abrupt turn. And as a result, very, I don't, very, very rarely ever had an air mid-air collision with any of our airplanes. Because I know all through the time I went out, we never had a mission. Now, of course, I only flew, flew 65 missions, when all together I think our group flew close to 200. But I only flew through 65, but in my 65, I never, never saw a mid-air collision. And we definitely missed, uh, we definitely did not have too many airplanes shot down through ACAC. In fact, all during the, the time that the B-26s were in the European theater of operation, there were 100,000 uh, aircraft, or sorties as they call them, one, air, one airplane over enemy territory is a sortie. So out of 100,000 sorties, we only lost 900 airplanes, which is less than 1%. And there's no aircraft in the world has ever had a record like that. And especially the heavies. The heavies were, had, had a lot of airplanes shot down from them. And they, they did their job, we did our job, but we were more effective than they were for what we were doing. And each airplane and ship it was supposed to have a definite purpose. Well, at the beginning, a B-26, had a terrible reputation. They called it the Baltimore Hoor and the, uh, the Widowmaker uh, flying coffin because at the very beginning it went right from the drawing board to manufacturing to the Army. 
no prototype to be tested or to be to be find out what the bugs were. So as a result, there were a lot of problems at the beginning. In fact, Congress decided that they were going to stop building the B-26. And Harry Truman was at the time was a member of that board, and he said he didn't want to waste the government's money and have airplanes that are going to be that are going to fall apart. Well, anyway, with a lot of pre-testing and a lot of testing that came into play while they using the airplane, it turned out to be the safest airplane and the most effective airplane of anyone in, during the war. And now, it's only coming out now that the B-26 was the most significant air force in the European theater, which I'm very proud of. And I, I love the airplane, and because of the responsiveness and the way it handled and everything, it was a great airplane to fly. Well, anyway, to keep going, uh, I finally got my, uh, my missions in, my 65 missions in, in January, January of 1945, and that's when they sent me home. So uh, if there's any questions anybody has and they want to ask me, that'd be fine. I'd take them from you now or a little later on when we're on at the table signing. Pick, yes? Uh, at B-26, we were six, uh, six uh, people. It was a pilot, co-pilot, and one man was a bombardier navigator. That was his training. And then you had a radio man, engineer, and tail gunner. And the tail gunner sat at the tail, and the radio and engineer, they were, either one of those would go to the, uh, to the top turret, and the other one would have, we had uh, waste windows at the uh, position there, and one there. So you had three gunners, and the, the bombardier had a gun in the nose as well. So, and uh, another interesting thing which I found out much, a year, much years later, many years later I should say, it's probably in the 80s when I found out about it, the B-26 had a higher kill rate against enemy aircraft than they had against us. And as a result, every time we were told we'd have a fighter escort, we'd rendezvous, rendezvous with a fighter escort while we were going out on a mission, I never saw a fighter escort. And here I flew, I was there almost a year, flew in 65 missions, and no fighter escorts. And I didn't know why. Maybe they felt that maybe they were watching over us and saw that we were not being attacked, and they took off, went someplace else to help somebody out. And one of the reasons for it is we fly such a tight formation that the enemy aircraft couldn't get in between our airplanes the way they did with the heavies. Because if the heavies flew far enough apart where five fighters would come in, they would attack one one heavy, and then they'd start swarming all over. They could go down in between the airplanes because they flew so far apart. You couldn't get a pipe or cub between our airplanes. So they all had to come from one direction. And when you've got 36 airplanes firing at least three guns in that one, in that direction toward where these five or six airplanes coming from, you've got to hit something. See, and that's why our kill rate was so high, and that's why we never saw any fighters. And as a result, the enemy fighters wouldn't come after us because of that. They went to the heavies. They could get more production as far as they were concerned over there. I only saw one enemy fighter, and he was, I think it was one of these, those new Messerschmitts, the jet, his twin-engine jet. He was flying at a much lower altitude going in a different direction. So, uh, in general, that's probably most of my experience, the highlights, but of course I could tell you story after story after story and, not, and, and you know, keep going for a couple hours. But if you want to come by and talk to me a little later, that's, that's fine. If there's any more questions, I'll answer some more questions for you. Yes? What was your bomb load compared to the B-7? Well, uh, our bomb load, well, one of the requirements when the, the government asked Glenn L. Martin to, uh, you know, ask for bids, one of it was that they wanted the air, a medium bomber to, cover, to carry more bomb load than the B-17. And the, uh, the B B-26 met that requirement. We carried 4,000 pounds of bombs, and at that time, the B-17 was only carrying 3,500 uh, 3, pounds of bombs. But eventually, the I think the engine power or whatever it was, they improved as the war went on, as with our airplane. As At the beginning, we had troubles, but they kept improving until they eliminated all the problems. By the time, you know, after a couple of years, every, all the problems were gone. The, the uh, airplane, airplane was uh, almost almost perfect for, for what it was it was designed for, and uh, as perfect as it could get. Let's put it that way. And 
So we still carried the 4,000 pounds and the B-17 was, car was carrying more. So, uh, but the, the B-26 uh, B had many, many firsts, which a lot of airplanes didn't have. They, they, they were the first one to have an electric uh, turret. They were the first ones to have a uh, four-bladed propeller. First one to have a tricycle landing gear. And uh, I think the first ones with the, with the uh, uh, sealable uh, gas fuel tanks where the bullet went through it, it had rubber insulate or rubber lining which closed up right away, the bullet would go right straight through and, uh, and wouldn't leak fuel. Uh, I don't know, there were a number of other things I can't remember, and, but if you want to look up on the website, you can look up B-26s and whatever, wherever you can find them, and you'll find that some of these first you go through them. So, all right, any more questions? Well, as, as I said before, uh, you can come over and talk to me anytime you want, and I'll sign your paper, your books, or whatever you want, and, and that's it. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>